think of the formation of the canon as something like the formation of the Oxford Book of English Verse. Hmm. Now, if you're asked to edit a new edition of the, the Oxford Book of English Verse, how much latitude do you have? Hmm. You have some, but you can't say, I don't like Shakespeare. <laughs> right. You cannot say, uh, Keats and Shelley, mushy. <laughs> no, no, they're in. So what's available now, you may have to make a choice to you include Seamus Heaney. Mm. You know, somebody recent. Yeah. And Ted Hughes. You know, somebody who might be popular with some people and then might not be popular with other people. Uh -huh. Those are the cases where you've got the choices to make. And I think those are the kind of cases that they had to argue about at Jamnia. Only as far as we can see at Jamnia, they said like only take things if you really have to. <laughs> In other words, the assumption was against. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's why, why we, they ended up with so little. Welcome to Great Bible Teacher Interviews. Hello, I'm Rick Jordan, president of Great Bible Teachers. And regularly, I have the opportunity to talk to authors, scholars, or practitioners in the local churches about the Bible and biblical interpretation or spiritual formation. Today, I'm very pleased to be able to present to you the interview that I had with John J. Collins a very well-known, world-renowned uh, Old Testament scholar, professor at Yale Divinity School. He, authored, he has authored over 23 books and many journal articles, hundreds of journal articles. He is well-known uh, because of his work in the Old Testament. He's uh, Irish, so you'll hear a little bit of a different accent than my Southern accent in this interview. And he was very cordial and very uh, kind to let us have this interview with him. He and Lee McDonald and Craig Evans recently co-published a book or co-wrote a book uh, that is called The Ancient Jewish and Christian Scriptures, New Development in Canon Controversy. We know that the Bible didn't just uh, appear, but how did it come to be? That's what we'll come to talk about particularly with the Hebrew Bible in this interview. Dr. Collins, John, welcome to Great Bible Teachers. I'm so glad that we have this time together. Uh, glad to be here. I, thank you. Uh, I always ask the first question uh, in our interview is, who has been a great Bible teacher in your life? And why would you categorize them in that way for your story? Well, you know, there are a couple of people I could talk about, uh, but perhaps the person that makes most sense to talk about is the person who got me into it. Uh -huh. And that was a man named Dermot Ryan, uh, who was a priest in Dublin and later became Archbishop of Dublin. Hmm. And uh, he, was running a, a very small department of Semitic languages at University College Dublin. Uh, the department no longer exists, unfortunately. But at that, when I first met him, I had just joined a religious order and uh, they asked me, what did I want to do in the university? And I had been doing classics for five years in high school. And I said, I'd like to do classics. And they said, you can do classics if you'll also do Hebrew, and then you can teach scripture. Huh. So I said, <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, as it turned out, the Hebrew teacher, who was Dermot Ryan, was much more engaging than the other, the classics professors. Hmm. And I would say what made him a great Bible teacher was just that he was a friendly man. Hmm. You know, that he took an interest. Mm -hmm. So that there was engagement mm -hmm. at, uh, all along the line. Mm -hmm. And uh, the textbook 
you know, from which I learned uh, Old Testament from him was John Bright's History of Israel, probably yes. well known to yourself. John Bright was one of those people who taught at Union Virginia for a lifetime. And, you know, it was historical, historical, critical, um, not by any means radical, uh, but, you know, uh, it, was, it was up to date. It, it, it was very engaging. Mm -hmm. And then it was he really who arranged for me then to get a scholarship to go abroad to, to do the PhD. Uh -huh. And I went on to Harvard. Uh -huh. And uh, there, uh, my main teacher there was John Strugnell. He wasn't so much a Bible teacher. He did things like Dead Sea Scrolls and Hellenistic Judaism. And then Frank Moore Cross was a huge influence. Mm -hmm. uh, Frank Moore Cross is probably the, the greatest Old Testament scholar in the English-speaking world in the second half of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And he trained, he must have trained about 50 PhDs. You know, it was, nobody can do this anymore. Wow. Uh, but, but he had a huge influence. He was a Southern gentleman from Alabama. Uh, but... Uh, he had studied with Albright himself, mm -hmm. and he had an amazing breadth of what he was interested in. Mm -hmm. Not particularly theological, it was more history of religion. Mm -hmm. And he was very interested in the ways in which the old Ugaritic traditions were picked up and transformed in the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. And uh, that had, had a huge impact, I would say. Yeah. I remember, uh, we'll get to your, uh, to, to more of this, but you, you quoted him uh, in your writing uh, in this new book a couple of times. Uh, and I remember one time, it was something about, um, except for the lack of a hungry worm, we would be missing First Chronicles or something. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes, because Frank had spent the 1950s in Jerusalem, you know, working on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. And he also used to joke that he thought his wife wished they had fed those scrolls to the goats. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably a little bit unfair to her. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've got a, a brand new book. Uh, book had its origin in a series of lectures at Houston Baptist. Ah. Craig Evans teaches. Uh -huh. uh, Craig uh, is a great activist in Bible study. You know, he is involved in all sorts of projects. He has a big one now on ancient literature as background ancient literature from the context of the New Testament. Mm. And then Lee MacDonald had been a colleague of Craig when they were up uh, in, uh, in Canada at one point. Uh -huh. And uh, so these were, you know, fairly popular, as we would say, lectures. And then Craig had the impetus to put them together. Uh -huh. And a lot of the emphasis on them was just introducing people to the other literature, you know, that wasn't included in the canon. Right. Because this is probably the first thing to be said about it. As you say, the Bible didn't just drop from heaven in a nice leather binding. Uh, this was a selection. You can never quite get away from that, but it was a selection from literature, from a much wider corpus of literature that was in circulation. Mm -hmm. And so I talked about the Jewish material and then Craig talked about the early Christian material and Lee talked about the, the actual formation of the canon, especially the more New Testament canon. Mm -hmm. right. But now, you see, we have a, a big factor in this for my contribution was the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right. Because, you know, back in 1947, Somebody just stumbled on all these fragments in a cave. And they turn out to be fragments of something like a thousand manuscripts. 
Now, you know, you've got 20, depending on how you count them, in the, the traditional Hebrew count, it's only 24 books in the, the Hebrew Bible, 36 in the Old Testament. But now we had a thousand. You know, so it, it just puts everything in a whole different perspective. Yeah. And 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 um, <clears throat> some of these writings were for the people who read them, scripture. That's right. And indeed, some of them continue to be scripture for some Christians. And I'm thinking there, especially of the book of Enoch hmm. and Jubilees, you know, that are still canonical in the Ethiopian church. Ah. But you see, for a long time, scripture had a fuzzy edge. <laughs> uh, nobody went about defining a canon. You don't even get to talk about a canon until about 400. Mm. And, you know, really, the, the lines of the canon were really oddly fixed in Christianity after the Reformation. Ah. You know, that Luther went in one direction and then the Council of Trent went in the other direction. And even then, you know, there were still books kind of wobbling on the border, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, you know, and even Luther realized that what he called the Apocrypha, you know, were still good to read. <laughs> uh -huh. So it's, it's that's which, you know, I mean, to me, I remember when I first heard this, what a kind of head jerking thing it was for me to hear that the, the Bible was not the Bible until even after the, uh, you know, well, the Old Testament, even after Jesus and the New Testament, you know, a good deal after uh, John had died and written Revelation. I mean, it was like, wow, it, yeah. it's really amazing that it, yeah. uh, uh, this book that we have, that we see as in the Protestant um, church, 66 books, uh, you know, that that's seems, I've always known it to be 66 books, but it, it's been uh, a real process to make it happen. Oh, yeah. Now, I think we can, in the case of the Old Testament, you can distinguish three stages. Hmm. And uh, what we've now come to realize is that those stages weren't so well defined either. <laughs> but oh, no. you know, the, the original Bible was the Torah, hmm. the books of Moses. And the question there, I think, you know, many people would say the reform of King Josiah in 621, when they found the book of the law of the Lord, and mm -hmm. he held this up and had everybody to perform a covenant ceremony and so forth. So this was going to be the norm. Mm -hmm. What we're not at all sure is just what was in that. Now, it was probably some form of Deuteronomy, mm -hmm. almost certainly not all of it, and certainly did not have a Genesis or Leviticus or Exodus. Mm -hmm. So then at some point during the Babylonian exile, and I think partly because you had all these priests who were carted off to Babylon, and they did apparently take scrolls with them. Mm. And so they had something to work on. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they did. And at least according to the tradition, then it was Ezra who goes to the king at some point and says, uh, we have our own law. May I please take this back to Jerusalem and have us live by our own law? Mm. The Persian king apparently said, great idea. Go ahead. And you know, they, they, he didn't ask for a translation of it. <laughs> I don't think any of the Persians could ever have read it or known what was in it. For mm. that of us, most of the people in Jerusalem couldn't have read it either. Mm. And it very much like if, if uh, the, the law that, uh, that Ezra took back was something close to what we now have in the Pentateuch, well, then he seems to have fudged a little bit when he was telling people what was in it. <laughs> and this is something that happens a lot and happens to this day, 
that mm. people will tell you that the Bible says things that it doesn't say at all. <laughs> oh. And I think you have the first examples of that already in Ezra. Mm. But uh, now already in the time of Ezra, now it wasn't quite the Pentateuch as we have it, because at one point you get a list of the festivals in the seventh month, and they don't have Yom Kippur in the right place. Hmm. So there was some tinkering with that. Mm -hmm. But actually, one of the things we learned from the Dead Sea Scrolls was that people were still tinkering with the text of the Bible down to the time of Jesus, more or less. Hmm. Now, it was very popular in that period to rewrite scriptures, to retell the story. This has happened actually with a lot of literature, you know, where people uh, maybe lacking originality, just tell the same story over, but put their own spin on it. Uh -huh. And a lot of that was going on. But then in some cases, it's very hard to decide. Were they retelling the biblical story, knowing that they were doing something different? Or were they actually trying to change the biblical text? Hmm. Now, there's a big text found in the Dead Sea Scrolls called the Temple Scroll, 66 chapters long, like the book of Isaiah. Hmm. And a lot of it is a reformulation of laws from Deuteronomy and Leviticus, in large part with the view to harmonizing them, to working out some of the differences between them. But the thing about the Temple Scroll is that it is presented as the word of God. It is not presented as an interpretation of the mm -hmm. word of God. Okay. So it looks like somebody was trying to sell this as, you know, the new edition of the Torah. Huh. And it didn't quite make it. Now, mm -hmm. you know, it must have made it with some people because Copying out a long text on a scroll was expensive, mm -hmm. you know, and it took time and effort. So they, they made some copies of it, but it didn't take mm. the end. But there were people still trying. This would be either second or first century BC. Mm. So they didn't really finalize the text of the Hebrew Bible probably till about the middle of the first century of the common era, maybe a little after the time of Jesus. Uh -huh. So that was one phase of it, you know, that was the, the, uh, the Pentateuch, the law, if you like. Right. And then the prophets, well, you know, the prophets seem to be said, one of the, uh, the authorities on this is the book of Ben Sirah, Ben Sirah's grandson, translated it into Greek in the in about 217, sorry, 117 BC. Mm. And he said, uh, my grandfather, it says my grandfather Jesus, uh, that was his name, Jesus, son of Sirach. Uh, and he said that he was very, he had studied the law and the prophets and he wanted to add something to them in effect. And so he, by then, knew of the law and of a collection of prophets. Mm -hmm. And equally in the New Testament, you often hear of the law and the prophets. You sometimes hear of the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. But you never hear of the law, the prophets, and the wisdom books. No. You know, uh, or the writings. Mm -hmm. now, there were lots of other writings. And in fact, now uh, there's some doubt as to whether it was quite settled what was in the prophets. Mm -hmm. Would a book like the Book of Enoch have counted for some people as one of the prophets? Mm -hmm. The Book of Daniel is in the prophets in the Christian Old Testament. In the Hebrew Bible, it's in the writings. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there was a, a fuzzy edge there too. Yeah. But now what became amply clear with the Dead Sea Scrolls and to some degree also with the, the rediscovery of the pseudepigrapha, which we can talk a little more about mm -hmm. um, a, back already in the 19th century, was that there was a lot more literature out there. 
There were a lot more books of the same general kind. And that's, you know, what has been fascinating in the last 50 years or so. You see, my, one of, well, my main predecessor at jail, I suppose, Pavar Childs. Yes. And Pavar Childs lived by the canon. And the shape of the canon for Bavard was it. That was definitive of the meaning of the Bible. Well, you know, it was the session I was listening in on this morning at the Society of Biblical Literature, which was on the Dead Sea Scrolls, was mainly talking about how we can deconstruct the canon. <laughs> <laughs> and in a way, you know, that this has been happening. You have major commentary series that now will include commentaries on texts from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Oh. Oh. Uh, there's a woman at this meeting who is working on a commentary on the Temple Scroll. Mm -hmm. for a series called Hermeneia, published by Fortress Press. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once something comes out like that in a major commentary series, you'll have a lot of people who won't know the difference as to whether that's scripture or not, mm -hmm. whether it's inside or outside. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the way perceptions are formed. As somebody said, those, those um, commentary series have a canonizing function. Ah. So I'm glad to see you have the Anchor Bible behind you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You've had a hand in some of that, huh? <laughs> I still do. <laughs> Are you editor? Aren't you, you editor? Edit the. Uh, I am. I'm still editor Yolanda. in chief of that. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a, such a helpful resource. Uh, yeah. So I, thank you for that. It's it's hard to get people to produce them. Mm. It's a lot of work, I'm sure. It's a lot of work, and it takes a long time, yeah. and a lot of people spend their lives doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So we have the. So there are three. Uh, categories. We have yeah. the, the the law and the prophets, and, and then the writings, and then there's kind of a fourth category, if you will. There's this, um, and also uh, with you things that are that are uh, out there in the uh, circulation. Yeah. And people are using some of them as scripture at the time, but they don't make it into what we now have as the Old Testament. Yes, but you see, in New Testament times, uh, those things were the writings. Mm, okay. In other words, you had the law and the prophets, and then you had an open-ended category. So, you know, there were things like the Psalms, that everyone accepted. Mm -hmm. How many? Well, that depends. Do you have a Hebrew Bible? Or do you have a Greek Bible? Or do you have a Syriac Bible? Mm. If you have a Hebrew Bible, I mean, if you have a Greek Bible, you get an extra one. Huh. If you have the Syriac Bible, you get a couple of extra Psalms. And then when you find the Dead Sea Scrolls, you have five extra. Huh. So, you know, these things, again, were shifting as to just what was in. So books like Proverbs, again, was well accepted. Ecclesiastes, or Koheleth, was one of the ones that they are, the rabbis still argued about, down about 200, mm. as to whether that should be in or not. Also, the Song of Songs. They had some misgivings about. Mm. Uh, but then there were other wisdom texts now found in the Dead Sea Scrolls that we didn't know existed at all. But there they were. Ben Sira comes along and he hoped, you know, that his book would be accepted as one of these writings. And to a great degree, it was. Mm. It's just that then the rabbis in the end didn't, uh, didn't take it. Huh. And I think in his case, it may be that he put his own name to it. <laughs> Whoever wrote the book of Daniel probably did so after the book of Ben Sarah was written. 
But he said that these revelations were given to Daniel 400 years earlier. Uh -huh. That's pseudepigraphy. And an awful lot of these extra books that have come down to us uh, are called pseudepigrapha. I don't know if you are familiar with the big two volume collection of the Old Testament pseudepigrapha, mm -hmm. edited by Jim Charles Worth. Mm -hmm. I've not seen that. Way back, that came out in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the first big collection of those in English was in 1913, edited by a man named R.H. Charles. Mm -hmm. But this, you see, what happened there was uh, one or two of these had been known continuously. There is a book that we often call Fourth Ezra, but if you have say an Oxford Bible with Apocrypha, mm -hmm. you will find it in as part of Second Esdras. Mm -hmm. Now the nomenclature of some of those books can be very confusing and especially the books related to Ezra. Mm -hmm. So Second Esdras includes Fourth Ezra, Fifth Ezra and Sixth Ezra. And it was different nomenclature in the Latin uh, and that Fourth Ezra survived in the Latin. But now in the Western world, the book of Enoch was only known by a few quotations in Greek until a Scottish traveler went to Ethiopia in the late, uh, late 1700s and uh, got either four or five copies of it and came back and Gave, put a couple of them in Oxford, put one in Paris, apparently gave one to the Pope. Mm. Uh, now, this caused a sensation. Now, this had been always scripture in the Ethiopian church, mm. but it was unknown in the West. And some parts of it, you know, were very similar to things in Daniel, for example, and even to things in the book of Revelation. Okay. So this like open people's eyes to the fact there's more stuff out there. Mm. And in the 19th century, a big hunt was for manuscripts in monasteries. Mm. First of all, in Greek monasteries, then in Syriac monasteries, uh, then Slavonic, Armenian, all of these turned out to have manuscripts in the name of some Old Testament figure. Most of them had very little in them that was obviously Christian, but they had only been transmitted by Christians. Now, typical of all that literature is they do not have much about the law. This is probably a matter of selection that the monks who were transmitting them weren't that interested in the law. They were much more interested in prophecy and wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you see some Jewish scholars have always said that that's not real Judaism. Mm. And that's still a live debate actually. But now when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, you couldn't dispute that what was in those was Jewish. Uh -huh. And some of the pseudepigrapha like the Book of Enoch or First Enoch and the Book of Jubilees were there in the Dead Sea Scrolls as well. Mm -hmm. So you see that there was truth on both sides, like what the, you got in the pseudepigrapha wasn't the full picture of Judaism at the time, but it was part of it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also, you know, these would have been regarded as scripture. Uh, the Book of Enoch is actually cited in the New Testament in the Epistle of Jude. <laughs> So, <laughs> so uh, that's that's part of it, isn't it? That that um, that Judaism, um, pre pre Christian Judaism, and then during the Christian era as well, um, was more than a, a there was more than a Judaism, uh, as there is today. There are multiple uh, you know, Reformed Orthodox, and at that time you had. Pharisees, Sadducees, the Essenes, who uh, Dead Sea Scrolls are, are from, and um, and then Christianity was a little sect that was uh, 
Jewish yeah. as well. That's how it started out. Mm. And, and these different groups. A, a lot of people, scholars, Jewish and Christian, uh, try to fit Judaism just into one standard mode. And I'm not sure, you know, well, I suppose, um, you know, for, for some strands of Judaism, it's important to them that their view of Judaism was always mm. what Judaism meant. Uh -huh. And so it's threatening to them if somebody says, but there were other forms of Judaism that weren't like that at all. Yeah. You know, that's destabilizing a bit. And equally, a lot of Christians buy into that and then, you know, want to make kind of standard Judaism, normative Judaism, as it used to be called, make uh -huh. that somehow normative for Christianity as well, mm -hmm. to some degree. Yeah. Uh, but in fact, there was great variety. And, and you know, why wouldn't there be? Look at, look at the world now and look at the range of variety. Right, right. And, and, and in the Christian faith as well, we have Absolutely. You know, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, uh, yeah. all over. I mean, and, and those then even have different uh, divisions. And, and so it, and if you look at it that way, it kind of makes sense that you would say, well, this group of people said these books are our holy books. And another group says, yeah, we like those. We also like these uh and so uh but now when i was in school back in college days i guess probably um you know there at that time it was taught that there was a council that met and uh and hashed at out yamnia at yamnia which for, for those who don't that starts with a j uh, yeah. uh, J-M-N-I-A, uh, but, but at that council, so uh, supposedly, you know, these wise men got together and uh, like in an intense faculty meeting or something and, and fought out, what is the core? What, yeah. what is, what's the core? But in your book, you, you, um, you, you say, actually, that's pretty much been discredited now. That, that, yeah. that council was not that was not the nature of that council. Yeah, it wasn't really a council. Mm. You see, what happened was that when Jerusalem, when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans, some of the rabbis went up to Galilee and settled at this place, Yamnia or Yavne, and uh, out by the sea, and they had debates about things. But you see, this isn't like a church council where people are called to summon from all over the world, you know, to come together to make decisions. This was a group of displaced rabbis arguing about what they'd got. Now, it's very typical of the rabbinic literature that it's not cleanly conclusive. That they will say, Rabbi X said this, and Rabbi so-and-so said another thing. And uh, the majority sided with Rabbi X. But there is another point of view. <laughs> <laughs> what they call in Hebrew, davarecher, another word, another opinion. Huh. So, you see, they didn't make firm or binding decisions, and they did not promulgate a canon at the end of it. Mm. Now, probably by the time they got to Yamnia, there was... At least, you know, for, for some people, there was consensus. The first time that we seem to have something like the shape of our Old Testament is at the end of the first century. And you get it, I mentioned Fourth Ezra, this uh, book that survived in Latin, but must have been written in Hebrew originally. Now, at the end of that, there is a wonderful scene in which Ezra complains that the law has been burned. Mm. And God says, come on, Ezra, I will dictate it all to you. You get five men to write it down. And he gives him a fiery liquid to drink. This 
is the earliest attestation of Irish whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he's inspired and he talks <laughs> continuously and he doesn't stop at night. And in the end, they write 90 books, 94 books. Huh. And he says, take 24 of them and give them to the washed and the unwashed that everyone may read them and keep the other 70 for in them is the fount of wisdom and the source of understanding. Mm. Now the 24 books, it's pretty well agreed. That's what we call the Bible, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. The other 70 books are probably things like the book of Enoch, fourth Ezra itself, and all these apocalypses and strange writings that were then uh, not preserved by the rabbis, but handed down sometimes through Christian circles, or in some cases showed up in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. Now, close to the same time, the historian Josephus said, we have only 22 books that are rightly accredited. Mm -hmm. And most people would say that the 22 books and the 24 books are actually the same books, but that they count them differently. Mm. You know, do you count Samuel as one book or two? Chronicles as one book or two? Ezra and Nehemiah, that one book or two? So, you know, there are several cases where you can fudge the count. Mm. Uh, so, but it looks like some group of Jews by then had agreed that 20 22 or 24 was the number. Now, Frank Cross, uh, whom I mentioned, thought it was the Pharisees, that what we got is the Pharisaic canon. Mm. Now, even the Pharisees didn't call it a canon. Uh, that statement by Josephus of them being rightly accredited is as close as you get in the, the first century. But then you see the Essenes would have had a lot more. Mm. And it may well be that the Sadducees would have had a lot less. The Sadducees mm. might only have wanted the, the Pentateuch. Ah. So that's yeah. the kind of situation that you had at the end of the first century. So, so what we have here, um, we've got potentially, I mean, thousands, you said in the Dead Sea Scroll, uh, uh, and then we have these uh, these three categories, and yeah. the one is pretty broad. The writings is pretty broad, yeah. um, and then uh, we find out that this wasn't uh, merely people saying this writing has meant so much to my spirit and to my people that we must include it. There's also politics involved, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> there is, yeah. Now, you know, an intriguing case of that. First Maccabees tells the story of the Maccabean rebellion. Now, you would say this is, you know, this is so inspiring that Mel Gibson wanted to make a movie about it. <laughs> uh, now, you know, it's Judas Maccabee. See how the conquering hero comes and all this. Written originally in Hebrew, no doubt, but the Hebrew hasn't survived at all. Mm. Who preserves that book? The Christians, mm. not the rabbis. Mm. Why not? My guess is the rabbis didn't like the Maccabees. The Maccabees were the progenitors of the Hasmoneans, the people who restored the kingship, though they were not from the line of David, and had all sorts of scandals as kings are wont to have. Mm. And so from the Pharisaic point of view, these people were lawbreakers. So no Maccabees in the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. If it weren't for Christians preserving those books, Jews wouldn't know what they were doing at Hanukkah. How about that? Isn't that, yeah. Huh. So that's, I think, one of the more overtly political cases. 
Yeah. A lot of the books that were not included were what we call apocalyptic. Mm. You know, things like the book of Revelation. In other words, they give you revelations about the end of history and about the heavens, about angels and demons. Some people thought this stuff was dangerous. Mm. You know, that it inspired people with hopes for imminent divine deliverance. And maybe because of that, the rabbi said, enough of that. We'll keep the book of Daniel like that has, that's accredited. Mm. No more. <laughs> <laughs> we draw the line there. <clears throat> yeah. Only one book with all these strange visions. Only one. Yeah. And I think, you see, that just got established early enough. I think of the formation of the canon as something like the formation of the Oxford Book of English Verse. Hmm. Now, if you're asked to edit a new edition of the, the Oxford Book of English Verse, how much latitude do you have? Hmm. You have some, but you can't say, I don't like Shakespeare. <laughs> right. You cannot say uh, Keats and Shelley mushy. <laughs> no, no, they're in. So what's available now, you may have to make a choice to you include Seamus Heaney. Mm. You know, somebody recent. Yeah. And Ted Hughes. You know, somebody who might be popular with some people and then might not be popular with other people. Uh -huh. Those are the cases where you've got the choices to make. And I think those are the kind of cases that they had to argue about at Jamnia. Only as far as we can see, at Jamnia, they said, like, only take things if you really have to. <laughs> In other words, the assumption was against. <laughs> ah, yeah. That's why, why we, they ended up with so little. What, what uh, we've got just a few minutes here, but, um, and this may be too big a question to try to address in, in the time that we have, but there is the question of the authority of the scripture and the, <clears throat> you know, what makes a writing the inspired word of God versus, um, you know, like say a, a modern book by a commentary writer that I, Get yeah. a phrase from that I ponder on for, for a day. Well, <laughs> you know, I, mean, I always have to deal with this with my students. Mm. And what I usually do at the beginning of the course, I tell them to bracket all those questions. Mm -hmm. And then we come back and talk about them at the end of the semester. Uh -huh. uh, where I can ask them, well, no, what kind of authority do you think this should have? So if you find a text in the book of Deuteronomy that says, go and slaughter the Canaanites, should you now regard this as the word of God to be mm. adapted for your own time? Mm. Hopefully not. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> you know, this is, um, the thing is, uh, you know, there is no criterion by which you can tell whether something is inspired. I think uh, there's a very good case to be made for saying that Shakespeare was inspired. Mm. That usually isn't quite the same thing that people mean by it in Southern Baptist circles. <laughs> now, uh, but uh, there is no objective test. Because, you know, people often tend to assume that if you say something is the inspired word of God, first of all, it must be historically accurate. Mm. Well, sorry, but now it's quite clear that a lot of it isn't. And actually, it's none the worse for that. Mm. If you recognize, you know, somebody who writes a story and puts in a talking snake, I mean, short of putting a stamp on it and saying, don't take this literally, what do you expect an author to do? You know, that's about as, as clear a prompt as you could ask for. Uh -huh. that, that if you take this literally, you're making a genre mistake. Mm -hmm. You're reading it as the wrong kind of literature. Mm -hmm. So it's not all. 
historically accurate. It's not all internally coherent. You'll find things contradictory in it. And the thing that bothers people most actually is it's not all morally edifying. Mm. And this is what has become more and more and more painfully obvious. Mm. And you know, this business of slaughtering the Canaanites is one issue. The whole all the laws of slavery. Mm. Right. You know, back in the 1860s, there was a, a, a man, I don't think he was a professor at jail, he had studied at jail. Uh, and it was, he was one of the first prominent American biblical scholars. And he said, uh, you know, the Bible does not condemn slavery. Mm. He was right. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, you got to deal with this. Mm -hmm. If at the end of that, you still say, you want to say that this is the inspired word of God, fine, but now you got to explain to me what you mean by that. Mm -hmm. Because if you are still holding to kind of the standard expectations of what that means, this is very problematic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If on the other hand, you know, you're prepared to revise what you mean by it in light of what you actually find. Actually, I think you may end up with a much more interesting Bible. Yeah. You know, when you get it out of your system that this book has to be right about everything, mm. take it, you know, I would say for what it is, which is to say writings that have come down to us from hoary antiquity, the oldest stages of our tradition, a lot of the seeds of what civilization would become, but more than 2,000 years old, Nothing is going to look quite the same after the passage of that much time. Right. So there you are. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate this. This has been enriching to me and, uh, and I hope is enriching and enlightening to our viewers. Uh, you, you, you probably have a lot to chew on. Uh, those of you who have watched this now, uh, which is good. And there's more that you can uh, read, you, you know, get the book, Ancient and Jewish Christian Scriptures, New Development and Canon Controversy. Um, it's, it's accessible. You can read it. It's written by top scholars, but they, they, they are writing in a way that you'll be able to get, to get it. So um, thank you for that work and for so much of the other work uh, that you do and, and continue to do. Uh, John, thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure.